Jacob uh, was supposed to be with us. He was with us. He wasn't feeling too good and went back to uh, bed for a little bit because his nose was bleeding. And so he said he should be back soon. So we're going to start without him and ho let him hopefully wrap us up. But we got quite a few interesting topics today from Scotland to Iowa, Ohio to New Zealand to uh, Queensland, all over the world, important things are happening. And also a certain small university in Kentucky. We'll be talking about that and some interesting quotes from some of the leadership there. So, um, so let's go. Um, we, we prayed already. And so the first thing I want to, uh, talk about is, uh, I'm an ex-railroad man. Many of you guys might know this. I saw some of the films of this um, train wreck some 20 miles before, and it had a kind of a ring around one of the wheels. When I was a railroad man, every time you go around the curve, you look back to see if a wheel's brake is stuck, okay? You had to do that every curve, left side, right side every time. And then also we had what were called hot box detectors, which would see if you, any of your wheels or any of the axles were actually, um, were actually um, hot, uh, exceeding normal perimeters. And uh, so, and then what happens is you get a loud blast, like a siren upon the, uh, uh, in the engine. And you were called by the train master who said, look, you have a, a hot box or axle 25 behind the engine. And so you would have to come to an immediate stop. Yeah. This was the procedures and the rules. And then the flagman would, or the brakeman would get off, walk back 25. Uh, he would uh, cut the, the knuckles, separate the train. And then he would try to uh, turn the brakes off on that, particular car and then they would slowly slowly we would pull it up to a siding and set it off till um those that service the cars would um would would fix it but um this didn't seem to have happened i i you know i know there's all sorts of uh stuff happening in the uh um railroads about trying to get the uh, um, supply chain back up to speed and maybe railroads are shortcutting um, short uh, their maintenance and all this. And so we don't really know right now and they're having great trouble over there. And um, so I know at least this, that rules weren't followed. And and you have over when I was on trains, over 666 rules were on there that you had to know and you were responsible for. It. And so at least if they didn't look back and see that that wheel, the brake was stuck and and making that wheel super hot, they can glow red hot, even though they're real thick still. And so if this is the cause, well those guys should be fired and they will be probably anyway. But uh, this um, explosion has of course caused a lot of problems and we're gonna be taking a lot of that. Isn't that backstages today? We're gonna to be talking about that. We'll be talking that and some other things as well that kind of connect together. Yes, that connect. In a weird way in a weird way. So we'll be looking at that. So Jacob has joined us. We're glad to have you. Yeah. Jacob. They, they had a hot journal on that train, that's for sure. But they had no hack. There was no caboose anymore. Yeah, but they also went over hot box detectors and they also, I did. Oh, I did. if you look at the films, 20 miles before it uh, derailed, oh, boy. Oh, boy. they had, you could see this, like, you remember Jacob, when we were on railroads, you could see the wheel, the sparks going all oh, around the boy. wheel. And, you know, and so they, for 20 miles, they drugged this thing and- uh, what, 20 miles with a hot journal? With, uh, with stuck brakes, Jacob. You know, a hot journal would just be the- just the box. journal would just be that, but they went over a hot box and 
and the no one saying whether it was sent an alert or whatever yeah, but yeah. you know if i was on a train if you were on a chain and you see a brake sticking you yeah we always, we always had to watch for that stuff on curves but but the way it is now they're supposed to have those infrared detectors that send us with, with the cab signals yeah go right, go right to the cab signals yeah but but you know look I don't want no wheel to fall out on my watch and you wouldn't either. So every curve, I would get up and even go look on the engineer side and walk back and sit down and watch my side. I did both sides. I, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's one of the big things you did. So why they didn't see for 20 miles. And I know they've got curves. That's up in Pennsylvania and early Iowa. They I guarantee you they have curves up there. You're supposed to observe your train at every opportunity. That's right. That's right. So, but we're going to talk more about the explosion and some of the after effects and, and why this little Trump voting town um, yeah. is not getting uh, support or aid. And okay, can we just go through the list real quick? We're live, Jacob. We are live now? Yes. And so we started because we didn't know. We told everybody you were going to be a few minutes late because of the nosebleed and everything. <laughs> so, Jacob, uh, well, let's. Uh, you wanted to talk about the resignations of uh, mm -hmm. Paula Sturgeon in Scotland yep. and New Zealand. And uh, so you want to take over there? Well, God answers prayer. And I know people... A lot of people who were uh, Moriel's medalists and so forth, who were praying that God would remove Adrian in New Zealand, and he did. He got rid of one wicked woman. But then another one who was completely wicked in Scotland. A lot of Moriel people in Scotland were praying, and I was praying, that the Lord would remove Sturgeon. And she's gone. And Blessing upon blessing upon blessing. What is her name uh, from YouTube? Wotsiki. Wots, Wots, uh, Susan has, Wojcicki. Yeah, Susan Wojcicki has resigned from YouTube. You know, you have to sing Ding Dong, The Witch is Dead three times. <laughs> this is... Uh, with all the bad news this week and last week, there's been blessings, and those three terrible women are gone. Call me a misogynist. I, 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 but they were all wicked women, and they're all gone. And I think that's a blessing. Well, oftentimes what happens, though, you get uh, one one bad person goes replaced with one who's twice the son of a devil. That's right. Queen Athlete replaced Jezebel. Yeah. So the wicked witch of the West replaced the wicked witch of the East. <laughs> so may God help us if they get some people even yeah. worse, because I can't think of anything worse. But also, uh, Jacob, did you want to talk about uh, an event at John MacArthur's place? I consider this most unfortunate. First of all, the publication Christianity Today is something I stopped reading well over 10 years ago. I think it is compromised too often on too many issues. Now, look, everyone knows I'm critical of John MacArthur's teaching on it's going to be possible to take the mark of the beast and still be saved. That is a downright, that's not just an error. That is a dangerously false teaching. And I'm critical of the fact that he, as a radical cessationist, he throws the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, without mentioning the financial scandals that the Julie Joy wrote about, without reference to any of that, I know he's surrounded by sycophants like Todd Friel and Phil Johnson. They treat him the way a devout Catholic treats the Pope. He can do no wrong. He's infallible. I'm critical of all of that. However, in California, particularly California, but not only California, but I'm in California at the moment. The courts have a strong bias to always favor the woman against the husband. Men are kept away unjustly from visitation rights with their own children. And things, abuses like this are very, very common on the West Coast of the United States or in any liberal state, but, but most notably in California. 
when you're in that kind of environment where divorce is easy, where there are uh, a, a general, where there's a general departure from any kind of traditional Judeo-Christian biblical standards of what marriage is supposed to be. John MacArthur, in fairness, has tried to stand up and preserve the family and the marriage in that environment. In a church that large, I can see in, in individual counseling cases where mistakes could be made. How are you going to have such a big church with so many people and so many cases involving marital counseling where mistakes can't be made? I think we have to take that into account. However, where you have a situation, as is reported, where a woman asked the elders and the leadership of the church for, for their support, warning about the husband, and then the husband gets criminally convicted, criminally convicted and sent to prison for pedophilia with his own child. The church at least owes her an apology and an admission that they made a mistake. And the claim of the article is that that did not happen. Now, look, what you also have is this, this anti-male bias. For instance, people claiming a little baby who loses its nappy crawling on a rug you, and you take the photo of the baby as a joke, there's these people who, who, who are calling that kitty porn. And if the wife says it, she, he was taking naked photographs of our baby. Things like this have actually happened in California in court cases, stupid stuff. Um, and MacArthur was standing against this kind of thing. But, but if there's a legitimate case where the father and husband, who MacArthur told the wife to go home and submit to him, molested the kid demonstrably, and he's convicted and sent to prison for, for something so grotesque, the church owes her an apology and needs to put it right. And the claim is that they failed to do it. Now, there are two sides to the story. The article only gives one side of the story. The other problem I had with the article is that it spoke in generalizations as if it was a common occurrence in the church. Each case must be considered on its own merits. We live in a situation now where if a Black person commits a crime and they got shot even by a Black cop, it gets racialized. Even when it's a black cop who does, who shoots a, a, a black culprit, it, it gets racialized. The stereotype comes out, this is anti-black, black, black lives matter. Well, that kind of sick game does not only take place in criminal justice. It takes place in family court, particularly in liberal states, and most particularly a place like California or New York or Illinois. And that's, that's what we're up against. Um, that's the situation. Nonetheless, MacArthur has taught serious error. He's taught significant error with the radical cessationism, but he's taught serious error on his teaching about the mark of the beast. And he's protected blindly by sycophants. This is just a Protestant papacy. But in a case like this, if you have a criminally convicted pedophile sent to prison because she was told by the leadership of the church to go home to her husband or be placed under quote unquote the discipline of the church and submit to him, the church at the very, very least must learn from it and must acknowledge its mistake and do so apologetically, if not openly, certainly privately. The claim is that did not happen. And if true, there is a moral indictment. Now, MacArthur has not responded. I can understand why you don't respond to some critics. Moriel very often ignores his critics. But there's also an aspect where if you don't respond, it looks like an indictment or admission of guilt. Now, like, like what we did, you can respond one time, here's our response, and then we don't respond anymore. Mongotha has not put out an effective response to that woman 
and 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 his church has not, and I think they need to. Um, things do not look well for the way that church is going. Uh, I have heard other doctrinal errors MacArthur has taught, not as dangerous as his teaching on the mark of the beast, but certainly his confusion of the blood, of what the New Testament says about the blood of Christ and the death of Christ. He, he's wrong. He, he's wrong. He's wrong about his radical cessationism. But wrong doctrine will always lead to wrong praxis. And in this case, there has been wrong praxis in, in, in this marital counseling situation. It needs to be addressed. If he doesn't address it, it is a imputation of guilt that is your own fault. And I have no love for CT Magazine, believe me. I don't read it, and I don't think anybody else should. Yeah, all right. Thank you, Jago. Um, turning over to uh, something that happened here in America, um, many of you might remember how Disney promoted a group a number of years back, the San Francisco Gay Men's Choir, and uh, they sang a song about taking Christians' kids. Well, Disney, I, hold it, I say Disney didn't promote back then. That was their thing. But now Disney has taken up the uh, this, this gay men's um, uh, choir, and they're going to have on Gay Pride Day at Disney on the 16th and 17th of March, they're going to be filming a concert about these people. And they're going to be promoting it. So if anyone's got a uh, uh, a reason why they want to want to cancel Disney, this would be one more reason why. This is the 45th anniversary of this this choir, and also the hundredth anniversary of 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 Disney. So they're making a big production out of this, and um, they're going to be sending out and taping this and probably playing it on the Disney channel for all to see. So anyway, no anybody Christian, got Yep. No Christian should patronize Disney. I heard a recording of that song sung by that homosexual choir from San Francisco. The, the lyrics are literally, <clears throat> we're going to take your children and you won't even know it. And this is a homosexual boasting of it. Better a millstone tied around your neck and you'll be cast into the sea. May the judgment of God fall on the executive leadership of Disney. The, the radicalization of, of kids is happening all around the world and Disney seems to be very involved in it. And Indeed. Yeah, so um, we had uh, going to the far side of the world now. Um, I sent uh, an email to our Moriel administrator in New Zealand and making sure he was okay after this earthquake yes. that he's not too far south of, of Auckland where they had a 6.1 earthquake. But they also had two cyclones, one after another that has done great damage to the North Island. Well, he said he said that he is okay, the family is okay, and he said it's it's put a lot of people at unease, and he's thankful for this because he's getting to witness to people because people are wanting to know what's going on. Indeed. Why are all these things happening? Jacob, can you speak to why is this time different a bit? Commenting on the Olivet Discourse back in the 1970s. I recall David Wilkerson, who, who I didn't know well, but I knew him, I, and I was friends with his son, Gary. And I remember David Wilkerson saying back then <clears throat> that God was going to use weather changes and natural disasters to get, to get people's attention. Uh, remember, preach the gospel of the kingdom, which is the message that repent, not just repent, but repent Jesus is coming. And God is going to use natural phenomena, disasters, meteorology, uh, weather-related disasters, to get people's attention. <clears throat> that there's going to be an increase in weather changes, an increase in these disasters. And of course, 
he was basing this on a vision that he said God gave him, but the vision was very much in harmony with, with the Olivet Discourse. I had no problem with it. I rarely disagreed with David Wilkerson. Once in a while, I disagreed, but generally I, I agreed with him. And what he said back then is happening. You're beginning to see the, the conti continuation of the rate of increase of seismic activity has been steady. But New Zealand, I knew my way around Central Christchurch. I was so familiar with Christchurch, New Zealand, I didn't need a local to drive me around. I knew where I was going, that at least to the places that I had to get to and things like that. I went back there after the earthquakes. It was two of them. Destroyed that city. I couldn't recognize the place. I couldn't recognize the place. The whole place was destroyed. I couldn't recognize it. That was in New Zealand. Um, now it's that's the South Island. Now it's the North Island. The thing about New Zealand is, New Zealand is similar to the United States. It's different than Australia and it's different than Canada. It's similar to the United States and similar to Great Britain and similar to South Africa. It has a strong biblical heritage. The Plymouth Brethren movement were huge. The first white people who the Maoris called Pakia, they made a treaty with the Maoris. They didn't seize the land per se. They made a treaty with them, but they brought the gospel to New Zealand. It had a strong Christian foundation as a nation and a society. It wasn't like convicts or Irish Republicans who the British wanted to get rid of like Australia. It was not like Canada that was French captured by the British and so on. It wasn't like that. It was more like the United States, more like Great Britain it, and more like South Africa. Despite the injustices of apartheid, there was still a strong biblical influence in that society. And it is a nation that has basically almost completely turned its back on its biblical heritage. And it really did have one. It really did have one. Christ was widely believed in New Zealand, widely. The Brethren movement was big in New Zealand. There were a lot of good churches. There was a lot of, a, a lot of good things from New Zealand. They sent missionaries to the South Pacific and so forth. It was a place with a rich Christian heritage that's all but been abandoned for the most part. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, James and Davey, I, I actually wanted to tie these two events together because Jesus talked about the days of Lot and he also talked about earthquakes and, you know, and phenomena in the sky and things like this. As a younger person, I mean, uh, I never thought that uh, I'd get this old. I always thought I'd die young, but for some reason I'm still here. But uh, anyway, how do, how do you see this and looking forward to the rest of your life? You're seeing the vast increase of homosexuality and you're seeing more and more of, of phenomena happening in the earth. Who wants to go first? James? Well, for me, it's, uh, it, it's a reaction to the fact that you have a, a very, very militant feminism going on today where men are giving up on yes, yes. on on women because it the the it's like a devil's choice at this point either magto, you magto yes magto it's called magto isn't it I, 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 men going their own way yeah. men going there yeah sure um but yeah it's uh it's 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 uh you there's there's really no uh explaining it other than that everything has a reaction and the fact that Women are now competing with men in the workplace and they're giving up some of the, the fundamentals of being a woman, which is to be a person that is nurturing to educate children. And you can see that with the children today. The children don't have nurturing mothers. They have mothers that for the large part have to work. So who do they give the nurturing to? The public schools. And what do the public schools yep. indoctrinate children with? you can choose your gender. Yeah. So it, it's no surprise that what used to be like, you know, like a, a small minority is, is continually growing, constantly growing. 
because we celebrate that. We don't celebrate family values. We don't celebrate traditional family. We celebrate the outliers. The outliers of society are the celebrity. Yes. All right, Davey, you want to pick up and see? Yep. Well, um, yeah, I'll address the two issues separately. I guess first, but like 15 years ago, even like 15 years ago, I guess I never, ever, ever thought I'd see the day where people would be den denying basic bi biology that God created a male and female. I never thought we'd ever reach that point where you'd have like 100, 200 plus genders where people could just choose their gender at will, where people would deny basically male and female and birth certificates and stuff like that. That wasn't something I never, ever envisioned. Um, so that was the one thing that really took me by surprise. We were always kind of aware of the rise of homosexuality and lesbianism, all that sort of thing that we kind of expected. But this um, suddenly, you know, there's no longer male and female. You can be fish gender, frog gender, um, you know. And the fact that it's taught and promoted in schools and this is what's presented as normal. That I never thought we'd see the day. Just going back to Disney too. Um, Disney is suffering harm. They're losing subscribers. They're tanking. They've had to lay off over 7,000 workers. And for anyone who had doubts where the Disney company was heading, um, this gay choir thing where they're actually going to take the old songs too from, um, you know, like the Disney I grew up with and remember things like, you know, uh, Snow White and Pinocchio, they're actually going to take the songs from that and do gay versions of them at this concert too. So oh, they're going to pervert the old oh, stuff as well as just bring out new perversion. Uh, but of all the people who lost their jobs, those two uh, wicked women, women who were um, pushing this and promoting this, um, uh, Carrie Burke and Latoya yes. now they're still in their jobs. They're still pushing yep. this and they're going for it. Uh, the other thing is the earthquakes and natural disasters, I guess uh, that's something I guess I've always seen prophetically of importance and I always thought it was going to ratchet up and keep getting progressively worse and worse and I really don't think we've seen anything yet what I didn't count on was the invention of the climate change god and years ago back like even back in the 80s people would used to mock religion it's oh you know they're the guys that throw people into the volcano you know to to please the volcano god to stop the volcano from yes. rumbling you know you throw someone in and now we've basically got that on a worldwide scale where people are sacrificing lives, people's lives for the sake of pleasing the climate God. You know, this yes. whole climate change, it's become a religion. Yes. And it's as just as stupid as, you know, years ago, these people would have mocked religion as, oh, you're, you're those superstitious ones who throw people into the volcanoes. Well, now they're justifying um, mass depopulation in, all in the name of climate change. Yes. So that's, yeah, something else I never kind of, you know, thought of. And and all this stuff is happening faster and faster and faster. I remember the first Earth Day from the 70s when they all told us that it was going to get so cold that we were all, the people in the United States were going to have to move to Mexico because otherwise we'd be froze to death. Well, that in, and they said 10 years. And then after 10 years, 80, it says we're going to get too hot. You know, and then, uh, you know, they keep constantly making these predictions. But, you know, when I see the things that the world is doing and, and the people at the World Economic Forum and all their plans for depopulation and everything, I understand the cup of wrath is filling up and the earth yeah. is ready to vomit us out, you know. And, you know, and, and I was reading Ezekiel the other day where Ezekiel through the Lord ties in the the correction of the Jewish people by removing them from the land but he also ties it into the judgment the judgment on uh, that he was going to pour out on the other nations so he gets his people out and then 
what he does is he purifies the land and by removing them all and um then he brings judgment on the foreign nation so i think when I, I start understanding how god is going to be coming back to destroy those that are destroying the earth and we're seeing this through all these things and we'll like i said we'll talk about the ohio thing when we get back there but we're doing so much wrong to this earth and you know i'm looking over here in the south i'm seeing evergreen trees just brown everywhere everywhere and you know some people are saying it's coming because of the things they're spraying in the sky and some people say it's some sort of beetle but yet when they cut the trees down and they look at the trees they can't find no beetles but you know another mystery but trees everywhere my neighbor's got like 10 trees and across the street 10 trees and all down these beautiful parkways they're they're dying everywhere so anyway so our earth is changing and jesus is coming soon may i add to the comments of james and of david sure, and of, david of course first, of course concerning what james said he's absolutely correct but there is another major factor any objective statistical analysis will show that children that boys particularly not having a father not having a father or more predisposed not only to dropping out of school winding up in the criminal justice system but they also statistically more prone to lack the lack of a male father image to becoming homosexuals the divorce rate and the rate of children born out of wedlock is also a sociologically driving force in the increase in the number of homosexuals we see uh sin begets sin so i affirm everything that james said but i do think the divorce rate is another, and the children being born out of wedlock, which is particularly crippling and, and tragic in, 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 in the minority and especially Black American community. It's something that Daniel Patrick Moynihan, the senator from New York, who was a Kennedy Democrat, warned was going to happen in the 1960s if it wasn't corrected. Well, it wasn't corrected, and here it is. Concerning what Davy said, that Latoya woman at Disney, I watched a film clip of what she did, denigrating Abraham Lincoln and all of his stuff, and pushing Juneteenth, Juneteenth, but she was just lying. She was, the narrative aimed at indoctrinating children was pure revisionism, rewritten history, half-truth, and she admits that she, she's pushing the homosexual agenda on kids. She admits it. May God do something to stop Disney. Yep. That woman is is absolutely wicked. Thirdly, I'd like to just talk of something very briefly, uh, my own background, which you, you guys generally know. After the hippie era happened and there was no revolution and rock music became commercialized and the Beatles broke up and the Fillmore East closed down and, and rah-rahs or the nerds grew long hair and stuff like that and pot smoking became no longer a secret underground thing. I, I was somebody who moved to the next level of rebellion, the underground world of, of New York, where I got into a, a, a I, I, you'd call it, it was truly an underground movement. Uh, and its patriarch was the artist from Pittsburgh, Andy Warhol, but he lived in New York. Now, I'd been at parties with Andy Warhol, and I saw him around, but I didn't really know him. But I do know people who did know him. But I was into this thing of after-hours clubs. And when everybody had been singing in the 60s, the Jefferson Airplane and Bob Dylan, the times they are were changing and all this kind of stuff, you know, and flower power, there was this rock band in New York led by Lou Reed and John Cale called the Velvet Underground. And they were singing about junkies and transvestites and things like this. Now, Andy Warhol produced their first record. And he said Warhol was, Andy Warhol as a pop artist was really a sociologist who used art, pop art, instead of a typewriter. He was really a prognosticator. He saw the way society was going. And he said, forget about this love and peace stuff. You're gonna have a time where there's not gonna be any meaning. And he would paint these silk, silk screen 
pictures of Marilyn Monroe or himself or somebody just with this kind of stare. And he, he was very clever what he did with 16 millimeter film and, you know, and he said, it's going to be just consumerism. And he would paint Campbell's soup cans and sell them for lots of money. Um, but he also said that this homosexuality and transvestitism and things like this were going to become socially normative. And then the Velvet Underground was singing about this, that there would be a mainstreaming of sadomasochism and and, and things like this, and of, and of opioid, of, of, of morphine-based drug addiction, and it would become culturally normative. Well, just like Bob Dylan said, the times are changing. The Velvet Underground and Andy Warhol said the times are changing. All this stuff they said, now you see it with the fentanyl, now you see it with these transvestites having little kids sit on their laps and read them stories in school at the taxpayer's expense. This stuff that, that Warhol saw coming is, is what happened. There, there were social prognosticators of, about what happened in the 60s, and then there were social prognosticators in the 70s. Fortunately, I became a Christian, but I was in that scene. I had friends who were drag queens, who were transvestites. I was attracted to it because it was still underground. It was the next order of rebellion against the establishment, because the hippie thing didn't happen, you know, really. So that that is the way the way it went. And you know, this stuff has come upon us. But I remember people in the 1970s saying that this was going to happen. Even the world knew what was going to happen. Then I got saved and I read The Vision by David Wilkerson and he said this stuff was going to happen. And it happened. Um, the only thing that has surprised me personally is the pace at which it's happened. Yeah. Yeah. That is what, not that the things themselves, because I always knew it was going to be like ancient Rome, but the pace at which that transformation has happened is incredible. Yeah. It's speeding up so fast. Uh, I think you recommended people if they want to hear something on the subject is your tape called The Vectors. Yes, The, the Vectors. Vectors. You can get that for free on MP3 through our website. Um, it's particularly good if you like math and physics, but anybody can understand it. Yeah, it's pretty simple. But now I want to um, approach. Uh, we have this a re possible revival down in Asbury um, Theological Seminary, and. First off, I want to start off with the gentleman, Zach Merrick. He said something interesting. He was asked, is there is this a revival? And he said, we'll know in two or three months if it's a revival. So I think that's a fair way, you yes. know, because you're finding people that are on one side saying it's not on another side saying it is. But let's take the guy that did the sermon, the 20 minute sermon, where people started um, coming down and praying and that prayer meeting is still going on. Okay? okay, so we'll see soon. But let's talk about some of the things that we do know are happening here. I mean, like first I'd like to do a little history tour um, on revival. During my time, we're going to have Sandy. Jacob can comment on it. Do other guys can comment on this? But back, uh, I used to live in Pittsburgh, and in 1967, there was the a weekend there where supposedly God's um, started using Catholics, and they had a Catholic charismatic movement, and then this spread around the world, and was really a false revival. And this went on for 67, but it was running parallel with the true revival that had happened in California through the Calvary Chapel movement and other things. So there was this, but out of the Calvary Chapel movement came some false teachers such as um, um, Frisbee, Ronnie Frisbee, and also um, help me with the vineyard guy's name. John Wimber. John Wimber. Thank you. And... Uh, out of the vineyard movement sprung some other things. And then by 
uh, false teachers, TBN, all these were going on. And John Wimber and all of his guys all created a, you had to have, you could have revival, but that revival had to have signs and wonders or there couldn't be a revival. And so this went on. And so you started having some other theologies who by 1991, you see the Kansas City prophets appear on the scene. And these guys were Paul Kane, Mike Bickle, Bob Jones, Rick Joyner, and a number of others. And, and uh, Sandy will bring some of this and so will Jacob. But these guys, Paul Kane goes all the way back to the 50s with um, William Brannan, who did the healing movement and a false revival there that was defeated and put down finally by um, by the AOG. But um, so anyway, John Wimber's movement with Peter Wagner, they brought this along. And then also Paul Kane became part of that movement. And he survives the uh, the Kansas City prophets who kind of peaked by 91. And then what happens is we have a Toronto revival in 94. This, it exploded in the world. And it uh, these people had to rent an airport hangar to get all the people that were there. I went there twice and filmed it. And they were saying things, they had a school in the morning for three hours. They would tell you what you're going to experience and they will tell you what you're supposed to do. Like if you hear a rooster crow from somebody, that means something's going to be said and you need to wake up and pay attention. So they're priming the pump and doing all this and would tell you about people laughing and everything so you could be comfortable. And so it was craziness. The world was there. The devil was there. Everything was there. So all these, this is another false revival. And Toronto was the false revival that soon phased out. But in the meantime, other places such as Brownsville AOG, the Assembly of God, had sent van loads of people. And also people came from the UK and took this revival back over there to Holy Trinity Brompton. And then this Brownsville revival all of a sudden had a had a, an explosion when a man named uh, Stephen Hill come, brought the anointing from Holy Brent Trinity Brompton back to Pensacola there on June 18, 1995. And so that thing fizzled up and it was led by uh, uh, the false prophet James Kilpatrick and also a very interesting character named Dr. Michael Brown. Dr. Michael Brown was the apologist for the movement. He was the one saying this was a true revival and he had a school for prophets and things like this that sprung off of this. And I got to interview him while I he was down there. So this, so Michael Brown is now one of the leaders in the NAR and now uh, uh, promoting all sorts of other bad things. But yet we need to watch out for men like this. And then you have the Lakeland revival that happens after this in 2008, which uh, brings in a new breed of prophet, men like Todd Bentley, which comes in. And then there's a whole bunch of all these old prophets saying this new breed is on. And when you think of new breed, think of like little gods walking the earth is some of what the NRA language is like. And so you could think of these people as they're infecting everything everywhere. And so, so we have all these false revivals. But here Asbury has a revival that is yet to be seen. And so what we want to try to do is talk about if it's a true revival, what would it have? And then also, would it be important to understand if it is a true revival for those maybe led by the students that are there, won't they have to watch out for false prophets and false teachers coming in and introducing destructive heresies and and all these things. And, and also, what would it be facing also? Because we know already that, um, that Tim Whitaker 
has showed up down there at and checked out at um, at Asbury, and he is saying that the LBTQ students are being protected by Asbury University. So that's concerning for us looking at this. And also, uh, Zach is uh, this guy that preaches sermon. He's he's a friend. He likes Bill Hybels. He likes Rick Warren. Uh, he likes some other guys that are very concerning. And so if you're introducing false teachers here at the beginning, you sh young people, you've got to watch out. There's false teachers that want, if this is a true revival, then you guys need to kick these false teachers out and keep them out. And also, Jacob, if you want to talk about the, the personal young student leader said that this is the fulfillment, basically, of Habakkuk one five. So I wanted to, Jacob, you want to go or do you want uh, Sandy to go? I'm happy either way. Sandy, you want to go first? Sure. Um, I'd like to talk about what a real revival is, first of all. Uh, I was involved in a couple of real revivals. One of them was at uh, the high school that I went to in the Philippines called Faith Academy. And uh, we just had a couple guys uh, playing some music. And in the middle, one of the students stood up. He said, can I say something? So they let him talk. And he turned around to uh, one of his friends and he began to apologize to him as telling him, how sorry he was and that he really wanted his forgiveness and you know and all that and the other guy stood up and he said yeah i forgive you um after that we didn't have school for at least a couple weeks and we had prayer meetings and we had to have buses take us down to the middle of Manila so that we could witness to people. A lot of people got saved because we were preaching the gospel. That's what a real revival looks like. No manipulation, like this guy over there at Asbury going, oh, Holy Spirit, just uh, fill up everybody in every row of the building, you know. No, that is latter rain business there. And in fact, he's taking a page out of what happened over at uh, John john wimber's church and that's what happened with them they uh what actually started the the toronto blessing was at john wimber's church and he invited this young guy to come in and i found out who the young guy was it was lonnie frisbee oh boy and he got up to the microphone and he he started saying come holy spirit come holy spirit come holy spirit over and over again and that's when weird stuff started to happen Next thing you know, they invited Paul Kane to come down there, the Kansas City prophet guy who was an associate of William Branham and actually took over in some of his crusades um, to, to come down to the church. And he went and talked with John Wimber and C. Peter Wagner. This is back quite some time ago and told them all about the latter rain, what they believed, the need for new apostles and prophets and all this stuff. Well, and then subsequently, <laughs> when C. Peter Wagner was uh, interviewed about it, he claimed he didn't. He, he claimed he didn't know anything about the latter rain. He couldn't understand what people were talking about, and yet he met with Paul Kane, yep. and so he lied to um, uh, uh, one of our associates, and he wrote an article about it. But anyway, this. The, the, the type of revival, quote unquote, that is typified by Toronto Blessing and Brownsville, which are virtually the same thing, is that, you know, th there's all this hype about, you know, getting the Holy Spirit and anointing and, and all this kind of stuff. It's not based on the gospel being presented and people actually being repentant for their sins and confessing their sins and believing in the Lord. Um, Actually, Brownsville lied to people. They told everybody that it was a true revival from the Lord, that they, the people were, it was a repentance revival, and that there was no prophecy or, or weird tongues or slaying the spirit or anything going on, which was an abject lie. 
Um, that's exactly what it was all about. It, it's basically all comes down from William Branham through the uh, Kansas City prophets and on through. So Asbury has been involved with these false teachers for many, for decades. And so that's what makes this revival somewhat suspect. Now, I'm not saying the Lord can't revive somebody who's a true Christian and really seeking out the Lord and wanting to, uh, you know, get back on track or whatever it may be. That's that's a good thing. But I don't see that that's what's happening at this thing at all. And um, that's just my opinion. And all I'm saying is I'm, I'm not saying that it is not a revival at all. But I, what I'm saying is be very wary of this because Asbury has been off track on a, on a number of in a number of ways for many years. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, am I meant to follow Sandy? Yeah, yeah, you were next. Uh, you got something too, Davey? Okay. Okay. Nope. Well, first of all, what, what, what the things Sandy said are certainly true. As soon as you see people chasing the gift over the giver or seeking the manifestation of the spirit or looking for signs and wonders. Remember, Jesus said a wicked and an adulterous generation does that. Right away, that tells you it's wicked and adulterous, spiritually adulterous. Also, you know, remember, all Jesus had to do was put on a show for Herod and he wouldn't have been proved. He could have got himself off the hook, literally off the cross, and he, and he refused to do it. Um, it's a wicked and an adulterous generation. When I went to Toronto, and I didn't go to get the blessing, I had been in Toronto for other business, but while in town, I went to check it out because people in England who'd been there kept saying, oh, if you've been there and seen it, you wouldn't have this opinion. So I went to see it myself and experienced it, and it was worse than what I saw on the films. I saw a phenomena in, in Toronto that was the same phenomena I saw in New Zealand with pagans, with the demon, demon possession. Yes. Sandy, Sandy's been a missionary in South Pacific. He knows what I mean. I've seen incredible demonic manifestations with witchcraft and, and pagan idolatry in New Zealand. And I saw people manifesting the same way, doing the same, same kind of gestures and stuff that I saw in, 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 in the jungle. And, yes. You know, yeah, I saw the same thing. And, you know, when you see, Sandy will tell you, when you see the real thing with witch doctors and things like that and sagormas and shamans in, in, in Asia and Africa, you, you don't get taken yeah. in by this stuff that people are calling demonic, automatic. When you see real demonic activity, it is, it's no joke. It's really no joke. It's J Jacob and I did a, did a video quite some time ago, and we showed that exactly what's going on was exactly what Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh That's was right. doing over That's there right. in Oregon. That's right. It's the same things. That's right. I, I, I had pastors from India in England who were saved out of Hinduism. In fact, Moriah has an Asian church of Indians, of people who were former Sikhs and, and Hindus. And they said that this is Kundalini Yoga. It's what we got saved out of. I remember they told us that, among other things. But anyway, another thing that Sandy mentioned, but he didn't tell you the whole story, not that I'm correcting him. Paul Kane was a homosexual and an alcoholic. He was a homosexual and an alcoholic. And he was not the only one of the Kansas City false prophets who had serious moral issues. Bob Jones was another one. Um, you know, <clears throat> there was serious immorality among these people. Serious immorality. I, we have a branch in Thailand and, ta and our, our ministry director there, um, who, who, who directs Moriel's ministry in Thailand, and he oversees the things we do in, in Myanmar and, and Laos and stuff. But uh, he was on a, a, an evangelistic outreach at the sex resort of uh, Patia. And uh, he wasn't there when it happened, but people on the team met Paul Kane, And Paul Kane admitted to them that he was there looking for boys. Um, you know, this this is this is what you're talking about. These are the kind of things you're talking about. You know, idolatry and immorality go hand in hand. 
You know, if, if you find idolatry and false religion and uh, an alien spirit counterfeiting the Holy Spirit, you're going to find immorality coming on its heels. Um, ser I mean, serious immorality. Not that I'm making light of any immorality, but Paul Cain was a seriously morally depraved man. So was Bob Jones. And, uh, but it's much, it's, it's too much to say. It's, everything Sandy said is true. Only, only he, he only gave a partial account. We'd be here for hours. Well, <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to add one more thing that, you know, the enemy is in the business of counterfeiting uh, true signs and wonders and true revival. Yes. And he is in the business of stirring up people's emotions. That's what this, yep. this meeting yep. is all about. And he makes it seem like that's the Holy Spirit. And people go, oh, I really felt the Holy Spirit. You know what? I don't believe it's the Holy Spirit. I believe it's the zeitgeist, which yes, Paul yes. says is the is the spirit of Antichrist, yep. which is already here. It was there during his time, and it's only gotten stronger and stronger. And yep. that's why we're seeing all these meetings. People are, um, they they are uh, in, instead of having a spiritual experience, they're having a solical experience. Yes. You know, and and. And mistaking that for the Holy Spirit. Or even demonic. It might be spiritual, but demonic. So right. I remember people in Toronto, one person was saying, I know it was the Holy Ghost. I couldn't control it. And they were shaking their hand like this. The fact that you can't control it proves it's not the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is ikrete in the New Testament, self-control. And it says it twice. It says in Galatians, and I think Ephesians, certainly in Galatians, but it's twice. It's ikrete. The spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. You know, I have to prophesy, hallelujah. When the Holy Ghost comes, I may have to prophesy. The fact that you say you have to do it proves it's not the Holy Spirit. The spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. All of these rules and safeguards that God gives us are thrown out the window by these people. But let's go back, please, to Asbury, Kentucky. Yeah. I watched the video clip of that preacher. He said things that were a combination of truth and error. Much of what he said was in principle true, but he was pneumocentric. He was praying to the Holy Spirit. In scripture, as we always point out, we pray to the Father in the name of the Son through the Spirit, and Jesus it sometimes was addressed in prayer in the New Testament. But the Holy Spirit is only ever prayed to in the context of the triunity of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit always, according to John um, 16, always points people to Jesus, never to himself. When you see the Holy Spirit being elevated above Christ, that's not God's spirit. That's not what God's spirit does. It's not how he operates. It's not his nature. So he prayed, he, he had bad theology. Right away, he had a wrong understanding of the Holy Spirit, which means he had a wrong Christology, yeah. a wrong understanding of Jesus, which in turn means he has a, a bad theological basis for everything else. If you don't understand Jesus and his relationship with the Father, and if you don't understand our relationship with Christ through the Holy Spirit, you are already on not only thin ice, but cracked ice. And yeah. that was his premise. Then he goes I, out and he says things which were in principle somehow true. However, he talked about love and the love of the Lord and we need the love of the Lord and we can't love others until we have the love of the Lord. Well, that in principle is true. It was not what he said. It was what he failed to say. But this we know love. When we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There was an underemphasis, almost a lack of emphasis on the gospel, on God's yeah, yeah. love manifested, John 3, 16, Absolutely. oh, God so loved the world. This down, this thing it, it was, you, you can't understand the love of God unless you understand propitiation. Yes. Unless you yes. understand that God loved us so much, he came as a man and was crucified for what you and I did. And he would have done it for any one of us personally, not just for all of us collectively. Unless we understand the cross and the resurrection, yes. you can't understand the love of God. And he was yeah. just on about the love. It may as well have yeah. been the Beatles singing, all you need is love. Well, yeah. 
<laughs> it's a true it's a true statement but it doesn't tell you what their love really is the right. love of god has manifested the fallen man through the sacrifice of jesus through propitiation which is under widespread denial now it's un under widespread yeah. denial by many people even professing evangelicals um th that he took our place uh on, on the cross now that that i found troubling on yes. word for the weekend i did a teaching looking at biblical patterns of revival from the book of acts and from certain ones in the old testament israel's revivals under ezra nehemiah and uh josiah and i showed the differences between false revival and true revival first of all at the first revival which we don't think of pentecost that way but it was a revival among the faithful remnant of israel who believed in jesus the church did not yet exist except embryonically before pentecost the church was an embryo from the time of the death and resurrection of jesus the church existed in an embryonic form but it wasn't born until pentecost when god's spirit was truly outpoured peter gave his charisma and his message was one of repent and believe now if you are not seeing the centrality of a gospel proclamation it's not a real revival a revival as we've said so many times is not a lot of people getting saved a lot of people getting saved is the result of the revival and it's the proof of the pudding that it happened but it's not the revival it's the result of the revival if there's a real revival you will see this expanded rippling of, of people being saved yes. if that's okay. not there it's not a real revival as the yes. result as the byproduct of it's something revival causes now you can't revive a corpse but you can revive a church okay the church gets revived and then it goes back to its first love and people get saved there's that secondly once that happened they devoted themselves first of all to the apostles teaching to write doctrine and if you see an absence of right doctrine, you're going to see either it's, it is a false revival or it is going to become a fad that's not going to work. Like the Welsh revival of, 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 of Evan Roberts. Well, it was a real move of God, but there was no discipleship. There was no really good teaching. It was over in a year and a half. And a real revival, a real revival has long-term repercussions. Speaking to our friends in Britain, I pointed out on, on Word for the Weekend, the one with Duncan Campbell that took place in the Hebrides in the late 1940s was the last real revival that took place in, in Britain per se. Um, there's since been a revival among the gypsies in Europe that's affected Britain, but the last revival in Britain was the Hebrides. To this day, it is a, not just the Bible Belt, it is the Hebrides are saturated with Christians. If, if you go there, you'll still find a lot of believers, third and fourth generation saved Christians. They send missionaries of all sorts. You speak there, these little fishing villages, everybody comes to the meetings. When I spoke there, the place was packed. I mean, it had a long-term repercussion. The Jesus movement. When I got saved, there was a real revival among hippies. Unfortunately, the group I got saved in, the Children of God and other ones I'd been in, like the Church of Bible Understanding, you became cults. But in the earlier days, before, before Chuck Smith gave up the ghost, Calvary Chapel was there for decades. It, it had its fundamental doctrines were right. Maybe there's certain things I disagreed with, but the fundamental doctrines that Chuck Smith taught were right. It had long-term repercussions. I'm not a big fan of Jews to Jesus anymore, but in their early days, and onward, they had quite an impact. They made it known in the Jewish community, in, 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 certainly in the United States, but in much of the world, that there were Jews who believed in Jesus and had Jewish theolog Jewish reasons, Jewish reasoning from the scripture to do it. Um, you see, a real revival is not a fad. It, it has a long-term impact. That did not happen with the charismatic movement. It did not have right teaching. It had experiential theology. And once that happened, mysticism replaced spirituality. There was all yeah. kinds of compromise. They, the charismatic movement has not restored Western Christianity. It's failed to do so. Society became new age. 
New Age won the battle, not the charismatic movement, yeah. even though ultimately Christ is, is victorious. So I look at these things on the teaching and I'd point to it. Now look, there's a split in the Methodists in the United States, the United Methodists and so forth. Many churches are leaving that movement over the homosexual, gay marriage, LGBTQ thing. There is a split between the traditional conservative, in Britain we call them Wesleyan Methodists. I think they call them that in the States sometimes too. The ones who still believe what John Wesley believed and the liberal ones. And this college was taken over by the liberal faction. Whether or not these students in the chapel were from the conservative faction, that is a big question that has to be asked because the Methodists are splitting in America over moral issues. Um, are these students from the conservative faction or are they from the mainstream LGBTQ woke faction? That is a question that needs to be answered. I would also point out that it's been pointed out to me by David Lister that th th this chap said, this is um, Habakkuk chapter one, verse five, I believe. Well, I don't know if he's saying that that's the, the actual fulfillment of the prophecy. Maybe he's making an application of it that the, the these Chaldeans are going to come and invade. It, 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 there's almost this hint or suggestion that China is going to go on the war path. That 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 that's what seems to be suggested. And of course, time will tell. I am encouraged by the fact that the guy said time will tell if it's a revival. I am encouraged by the fact that it began by people standing up and repenting, confessing their sins and repenting. That's a big thing. Um, I'm encouraged by those things. However, there's also a lot of evidence that it's contrived. This 200th anniversary of the Collegiate Day of Prayer. You have people who are good for nothing but injecting heresy and spiritual poison into any work of God. They've got Francis yeah. Chan involved. He's a dangerous man. He's ignorant, yeah. but he's dangerous. You've got uh, Wimber. Wimber, Wimber, Wimber is, is, is an agent of Antichrist. I'm the Lord, your God. You have no gods before me. In, in Wimber's yeah. peace plan, we have to unite with people who worship other gods, who Moses and Paul call demons to bring yeah. in global peace. Lou Giglio is involved. Jesus culture is involved. Um, th th these are dangerous, false teachers. Yeah. Not least of all is Michael Brown. Michael Brown is a proven false prophet. I've, do I've documented what he did in Jerusalem. I was in Israel at the time in 1988 with his bogus predictions of a second Pentecost and calling the national disaster, what we call in Hebrew, Shafraf, 22% of Israel's reforested land was destroyed by Muslim terrorists in setting forest fires. And soldiers and firemen were killed and Oh, it was it was a national disaster. And he said it was the Holy Spirit pouring out his spirit on Israel in the last days. And he had people up all night at a conference in Jerusalem. This is Michael Brown, the apologist for Pensacola. Guy Shevra was the apologist for, for Toronto. Michael Brown was the apologist for Pensacola. Well, yeah. what makes Michael Brown dangerous is this. Here's what makes him different. Unlike Francis Chan or these other people, he is far from ignorant. He knows better. He could be a very effective apologist, a messianic apologist, refuting rabbis and debating the messiahship of Jesus because he has an earned PhD in Hebrew from New York University. He's not a dope. Secondly, he has camouflaged his agenda by doing good things, standing out against homosexuality. He warned against Todd Bentley even. He's, he, he, he sometimes says right things that all of us would agree with. But underneath it, he went to the NAR Bill Johnson freak show, the same as he defended and was very dishonest in his defense of Pensacola, particularly the thing with, yeah. the, with the palsy girl who was vibrating and things like that. Um, he's not an honest person. And he, yeah. he's embraced one error after another. But what makes him dangerous is he knows better. He's intelligent. He's like a white collar criminal. He's like somebody, a computer hack with a PhD in computer science. Huh. He's not, he's not, he's not a clown. Yeah. Like, he's not a clown like the other ones. 
He's he knows he looks like Groucho Marx, but he's but he's not a comedian. He he looks exactly like Groucho Marx, but he's not a comedian. Jewish guy from New York, I know him. Yeah, kind of. But we've talked by telephone and things and debated. Yeah. But he's a dangerous person. And when you see, yeah, he goes. Like him, he he keeps going around to different churches and different conferences. Yeah. And he's an invited. He was. He's he was invited to by the yes. Southern, Southern Baptists over here at the uh, uh, Southern Evangelical Seminary. And I wrote to their dean and I said, you know, this guy is just going to come in there and pepper his um, remarks uh, by, you know, supporting Brownsville and all this kind of stuff. And the guy never wrote back to me and they just they yep. they welcomed him with open arms. But I had one more thing to, to add. You're so right about the fact that any true revival is going to be centered on Jesus, yep. not on the Holy Spirit, but on, on Jesus Christ. And right. I had a friend who was a missionary, and he unfortunately decided to, to get his doctorate from Fuller. And his uh, dissertation was, should churches be Christocentric? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Yep. Of course, they have to be Christocentric. At one time, they wouldn't you know? have Fuller if you didn't believe that. <laughs> that's why. That, that's why I. That's why I dropped out of Fuller when I was doing my doctorate there. Never finished my doctorate because I was, I, I, I did the research in England in Cambridge and and, and, and Tim Dial's Cambridge, and I went to Fuller, and I just, the Lord got me out of there. He didn't want me in that place. Praise uh, the Lord. He, I had an automobile accident that left me handicapped and I never finished it. But then I saw the way Fuller was going and I was, it was terrible. Um, yeah, no, re, revivals are Christocentric, but also his, his promoting this abstract definition of love that was religious, not scriptural. You know what I mean? Right. He does not def define the love of God scripturally, which is the gospel. Um, it was a John 3, 16, basically. He failed to do that. Now, look, I'd like to believe that it's a move of God, but you're going to have the, even if it is, you're going to have people like Michael Brown, who's an opportunist and a grandstander. He will jump on any bandwagon to promote himself. That is another feature of these guys, and Michael Brown being a major case in point. Michael Brown is an opportunist and a grandstander who will jump on any bandwagon. It doesn't matter if it's NAR. It doesn't matter if it's Bethel. It doesn't matter if it is Pensacola. He's a grandstander. He's like an Al Sharpton. He, he's an opportunist. Um, that's how Michael Brown operates. But I do reserve final judgment over whether this thing is of God or not, particularly because of the split that's taking place within Methodism. If it is of God, I hope it'll be like this. I do not deny that the Holy Spirit was outpoured on Azusa Street. Neither do I deny that for lack of right doctrine and right teaching, the thing went off the rails really, really quickly. Fortunately, with early Pentecostalism, you had some biblically based Pentecostals in America and Britain who put grain into the toxic stew. They withstood Branham, they withstood uh, Kenyon, they withstood. Uh, certainly uh, Amy Simple McPherson and things like this. They withstood the people who sabotaged early Pentecostalism and corrected it, and they brought some kind of semblance of a biblical compass to where Pentecostalism was going to go. Already, if, if this is a real move of God and it's not something that is orchestrated and pre-planned, if it is a real move of God, which I'd like it to be, they're going to need some people to put grain into the toxic stew. I can see already opportunists are jumping on the bandwagon and they lack right doctrine. Their doctrine is not right. I'd point also to the Bible teaching we did on um, Word for the Weekend, which is going to be on RTN and on Moriel this weekend. It should be Saturday, late Saturday afternoon in the West Coast of America, Saturday evening uh, in the East Coast, sat late Saturday night in England, and then it'll be Sunday morning in Australia, New Zealand. So, and, and Canada, of course, be some of the same as the States. 
So I point you to the Bible teaching we did. What we did, what I did was I compared the patterns of revival from Acts in the Old Testament to the so-called revivals we have now. Is it a revival? Is it a fad? Or is it a counterfeit? And that's the subject on um, Word for the Weekend. It'll be on Moriel TV. Well, Jacob, you're not asking any other question, or we are not asking any other question than what Zach, the guy that preached the revival, uh, said. We'll know in two or three months. But yes. that's so, so that's a fair question it's to a ask. Fair it's Look, a fair I didn't statement. dislike the guy. I just thought his theology was shallow. Yeah, and I'm not real happy with he likes Bill Hybels, among others. Well, look, you, so, look, if you're into Bill Hybels, you're following a false yeah. teacher. And we also had uh, a guy named um, Tim Wakeman went there. Is that is it the right name, Whitman? Can anybody help me? I mentioned him earlier. He went there. Um, I do not recall, unfortunately. Can you, you remember Anyway, he's a progressive uh, teacher. He went there, and he's uh, he's kind of famous. Uh, it's, uh, what did I do with my my notes? While you're oh, looking, Ellen? just to mention Marco, uh, let me know that the uh, the founder Michael uh, Zachary is a huge fan of Mark Driscoll as well. Oh boy, Mike Driscoll. Bad news. Bad news. Uh, kind of to just talk about what uh, Jacob was talking about earlier uh, about his sermon. One of the things that struck me is there was no, there was nothing mentioned about repentance. There's nothing about conviction of sin. Yep. The blood of Christ, the first thing it does is it convicts us of our sins, then it cleanses us of his of our sins. Then what more along what he was talking about it consecrates us to be people that are telling other people about what the blood did for us as far as cleansing with i i think about when jesus talked to the the woman the samaritan she said this man told me everything i did ever come and see to me you know that's a revival she she was confessing this man told me all the things i've ever did in my life and it, it, she she repented of him. And there was nothing of that. I, I just, you know, unless there's some well, kind of conviction. No gospel in his message. Yeah. Nothing. No yeah. conviction of sin. How can there be a revival? Yeah. And and we and we know, Jacob, that of course that the devil likes to destroy things when they're young yes i think you have a teaching you talked about where the devil always shows up to try to get lambs when they're young and that's destroy right them. and so uh if hopefully our, our hope is it's a true revival i would love to see a worldwide revival but I have all sorts of yellow signals going off in my mind and from discernment. Now, James, do you have, can you talk about some of the young people that are um, teaching and are bad teachers that are influencing a lot of uh, the young people, the millennials and et cetera? Unfortunately, what, what seems to happen a lot of the time is, you know, when you have people like Todd, Todd White, Bill Johnson, they begin uh, to draw people in by using a Pied Piper scheme with Jesus Culture, with Hillsong United. All of them are calling the youth because the music is somewhat relevant to their tastes. Now, tastes yes. have, have, have shifted quite a bit since... I was a, a younger man. Now they're even further, further out, but at least to the point where it's relevant to the culture of today, a lot of these churches have elevation worship, Grammy, Grammy winning um, music team. And they have a person like Stephen Furtick, who's going to then teach you the doctrine. I mean, you're going from one bad 
rat trap yes. to the next. Yes. yes. With Jen Johnson and Jesus Culture, you have another award-winning music group, and they're going to lead you to Bill to Bill Johnson, who yep. is going to tell you, you know, he's going to mix Christianity with mysticism, basically, yes. and and get and give you a whole other gospel. So again, we from one rat James trap James. to another. Yeah, we've highlighted what James is saying for some time that young people are getting their doctrinal theology from singing choruses yep. with, with no reference to the fact that very often the lyrics of what they're singing are not scriptural. Yep. The rivers, the river song from Pensacola being a case in point, that was their theme song. And there's not a, there's not a line in that song that is doctrinally cogent. <laughs> yep. uh, Sandy, you want to speak to the music part? I know you've done a lot of, uh, You've done some good videos on this, uh, the music, how it's influencing the church yeah. in a bad way. Well, I will, uh, you know, point people to uh, <clears throat> Act TV on YouTube and also on RTN. And I have, I think I have all three videos up there on uh, testing music in the church. I, I think it's the responsibility of the pastoral staff of any church to test the music that they are allowing to be played in their church. Um, so few are doing that, but actually the, especially the people who are writing new music, they need help. They need help doctrinally to be able to, to write doctrinal, good doctrinal lyrics. Yes. And uh, we need to test all the music out there because so little of it is actually doctrinally sound and some of it's actually dangerous. Um, and I'm not just even talking just about modern songs. There's hymns in the hymn book that are doctrinally dangerous. So you've got to test it by what the Bible teaches um, and pick out the ones that have good theology that, you know, because music is a way to, it really is almost a superior way to help you to remember um, things and, and to help you to remember the doctrine, doctrinal ideas. And uh, we should, you know, the churches should be using that to try to help people. Instead, it's all these songs. And I'll, I'll never forget Dave Hunt back when Jacob was out there in, in, in Hawaii doing a conference. Dave Hunt said, I'm so tired of all these songs about I, me, my, you know, everything's about me. And, you know, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And I, that was my pet peeve for years and it's getting worse and worse. It's all, you know, it's all about me, what I want, how I feel. And, you know, that's exactly opposite to what the Bible teaches. The Bible, <laughs> Christianity is so radically different from any other, you know, anything else out there because the whole emphasis is on denying yourself, taking up your cross and following Christ. Yes. Yeah. So well, please. we shall see. We shall see what shall become of this. But the caveat is out there. We are not saying that it is not right, but we are saying that there are plenty of warning signs of, of, of danger that makes it, if not suspect, certainly it makes it precarious at the moment. Um, yeah. May the Lord be honored. And may people not be deceived by another counterfeit revival. Young and people were... revival may not turn into a fad, but I already see the wolves gathering. Yeah. Young people, we tell we want a revival. My generation, Sandy, Jacob, and me, we saw one. We want one for you. But we also know that we've seen lots of false revival and we've seen the devil get into the midst right away. Please be on your guard. We're not trying to be mean. We're not trying to be wrong. We are saying these things in love to you that if there, if there's the devil is there, false teachers are there, you got to sweep the house. You got to shoot wolves and you got to keep them out. Otherwise this will fizzle out. That's right. Just be another freak show. Yeah. Be on your guard. 
So are we up for the time for uh, questions or? That it is that time. Jacob, we have questions and answers. We're gonna probably take just a few here. And uh, I know you can answer any question. I don't know about that, but I'm giving my best. You can always say you don't know, but you got some questions. I don't know. Go ahead. Have we got some questions? We do. Uh, I will read the first one off. Give me just one moment. Yeah. Just like when the second World Trade Center was hit by another plane, we knew this tragedy wasn't accidental. Do we feel the same for the two train derailments? I don't know if they were pre-planned, but what I do believe is this. It is a blue-collar yet conservative voting area, and the Democratic Party hates working-class people, lower-middle-class people who are not Democrats. They always considered it to be that. They thought that they, they're always going to have the Blacks. They're always going to have the Hispanics. They are always going to have the, the factory class. Okay, so this is an area that is been economically devastated by deindustrialization, yet they are conservative voting, Republican voting. It's Trump country. Um, I think that accounts for one of the reasons why the Biden administration is ignoring the reality. I don't think it was planned or orchestrated, but I do think um, what was certainly what Buttigieg said was it was a complete lie, blaming it on Trump. That was based on a law passed in 215 before Trump was president. Moreover, the directive that Trump issued only had, now I'm a former railroader, as is David Listener, it was only for oil tank cars. It was not for hazmat rail cars. So Buttigieg openly lied. But perhaps the thing that troubles me the most, in addition to what they're doing to the poor people, denying them FEMA aid, um, for politically motivated reasons, I'm quite convinced, is this. It just shows the hypocrisy of their green climate change agenda. You have a, a, an environmental, a localized environmental disaster that can have repercussions on, on a wider scale, potentially. If, if something as bad as what happened in upstate New York with Arm and Hammer that time with the Love Canal, it's, it's something along that line, maybe not as big, but along that line that can affect water tables. Senator Vance, went down to the brook and he showed what was happening when he stirred the water with the stick and the to toxins. You're talking, you're talking about serious to toxicological chemical compounds. Um, you know, um, it shows they really don't care about the environment. They just play the climate change card as part of a political control agenda. You know, they don't care about homosexuals. They don't care about homosexuals. They're, they're quite happy, quite happy to make a treaty with Iran who hangs homosexuals. They don't care about women. They're quite happy to have transgender males with bigger orthomusculature playing on, on girls' teams and winning because girls can't compete against them. They don't really care about women. They don't really care about blacks every city that you go to the Democrats control is is unbelievably violently crime ridden with the majority of it, not all of it, but the majority of it is black on black crime, black killing other blacks. They don't care about blacks. They don't care about women. They don't care about homosexuals. They don't care about anybody they, they pretend to care about. When you look at the reality of their policies and what they do and how their policies are implemented. Well, it's the same thing here. They don't care about the environment. They don't give a rat's tuchus about the environment. It's not about that. Their whole climate change agenda is about something very, very different. All right. Well, I, I did hear one thing, um, Jacob. There's a new program called uh, Precision Train Servicing, which uh, or that um, they're the Biden administration put in try to alleviate the um, um, the the supply chain problem. Right. 
And uh, from what I've heard from a couple train guys that they're suspending hog law. Oh boy. Yeah. So people are overworked. They don't have enough people. So they're kind of looking the other way. See, we called it the 12 hour law. Yeah. Now we used to violate it to get extra deadhead miles and stuff like that. But (laughs) everybody did, but it was still the law. You know, you couldn't flagrantly yeah. violate it. You but, got, you got law. You'd have yeah. to call. I'm a, I outlawed 1205. You know. Yeah. Now if they've suspended you, you, that. Look, or they're they, looking the other way. They're letting them. Uh, they're not looking. At, from what I've been told, is that uh, you can work straight through or come back right after returning home without your eight hours off, and they put the time on another day. So. I don't know. I haven't verified all this, but this is some of the things I'm hearing from fellow railroad workers. Well, so I worked and you worked on locomotives. Yeah. I don't think most people understand how powerful a locomotive is. How dangerous. And, and how dangerous. How dangerous trains can be if they're not properly manned by people who know what they're doing. Yep. I was in Grand Central Station when I was a kid in New York. I was working as a brakeman. And we were, it was these are passenger equipment. And I was, you have a third rail there. So it was a platform, an elevated platform with the third rail, right? And I'm under a knuckle doing, doing a couple, getting the air and a car knocker at, at the back of the train waves his lamp and the conductor and the engineer looks back and sees there's a signal to go. The air brakes go off, the shoes go off. I'm under the knuckle. I got I got eleven hundred volts between me and the and, and the and I had a train was moving. I had to hop over eleven hundred volt live uh, third rail line and duck underneath the uh, platform. And fortunately, my workmate saw what happened and jumped on and he dumped the air. He pulled the emergency cord. Um, trains can be very very dangerous. I know guys have got their legs chopped off and all star, and these were experienced men. You know what I'm talking about. Um, it, it, you, you cannot to, to, to relax safety standards on trains is as insane as relaxing safety standards on airplanes. Yeah. It's just as dangerous. And a yeah. locomotive is, 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 is unbelievably 3,600 or a pair of 30, the power of that stuff. It's, it's incredible. It is dangerous. I remember back when I was thin enough working on the railroads, I could slip between the ties when I was walking, when I was replacing a knuckle on the bridge that went across the junction right there of the Mississippi and Ohio at Cairo. We busted a knuckle and I had to replace it in a driving rain at night. And it, it's very dangerous. You had to watch you, every step. You want to tell railroad stories? The longest train trestle in the world is Hell's Hell's Gate in New York. Yeah. With, with the Harlem River and Long Island Sound and the East River come together. Goes from Manhattan to Queens to the Bronx. Big swirl. And it's an arch bridge. And big. I had, we had to use push poles to get long freight trains over it. I had to go out at night in the ice storm. Yep. Right? And pull the knuckle on the fly out yep. there with the wind blow. And if you went off that thing, you were dead. Yep. Nobody ever can you call it Hell's Gate because the courage can it's if, a if, super if dangerous can job. You, yeah. <laughs> I, I had to switch DuPont factory down in Millington, Tennessee, which had so such a bad chemical, just the smell. They put a smell into it of almond. It said in our train manual that if you smell almonds, it's uh inhalation causes death. But we used to have to shift ship uh that that hydrochloric acid and yeah. uh, hydrogen, ammonia, all these things. I mean, they had the worst chemicals in the world. I had to be so careful in doing everything. A vibram one into the other. Well, anyway. We used to move nuclear waste yeah. from Indian Point uh, nuclear generator on the Hudson above New York City. Yeah. And we moved nuclear waste from Groton, Connecticut from the submarine fuel. And, you know, you got special trains to do that. Well, there needs to be special hazmat trains. That train that went off in East Palestine, Ohio, it had food carrying grain cars on with hazmats. 
That should be, the FRA should make that completely, completely illegal. But I think we're boring people with technical error. Talk. Yeah, sorry guys, but we, and we, uh, next question. All right. Do you believe that the words of Jesus recorded in Luke 17, 21 through 37, could apply to discerning these types of events? And just for a refresher, I, I have it ready for you, gentlemen. Okay. Oh, looking it up. Tell me, Luke 17, what? Luke 17, 21 through 37. It's talking oh. about the... Uh, Jesus being in the wilderness and thing. There it is. Kingdom of God. One second. Yeah. I'm in Luke 17. Give me the verses, please. 21. 21 through 37. Okay. Kingdom of God is not coming. Definitely has a last day's application. Yes. Starting in kind of in verse uh, 25. Are they, are they wondering about this, this revival? Is that what they're trying to apply it to? Or does this apply to it? I think I think it's probably a general, uh, you know, where culture is going, society yeah. is going. If if I okay. if I were to guess, okay, okay, it's called inaugural eschatology as opposed to overrealized eschatology. Um, George Eldon Ladd had certain things right and certain things very wrong. He was the main theologian who wrote on it. The kingdom is now, but not yet. It's now, but not yet the way i explain this is the normandy invasion officially d-day in june of 1944 was the 6th of june it was the 6th of june was d-day but to the people in the know to eisenhower and montgomery and churchill they knew d-day was june 5th british and american commandos began landing in preparation on back of German lines by parachute and things like this, um, to to perform certain s sabotage missions and so forth to prepare for the beach landings on the sixth. So everybody knew the invasion was June sixth, but the people in the know knew it was had begun on June fifth. The invasion is now, but not yet. Well, the kingdom of God, it is now, but not yet. That is the first thing we have to understand. People are looking for signs to be observed for the kingdom. The kingdom is already here. The kingdom is already here. It's within us. We are citizens of a coming kingdom. It is already here. Um, when the signs come, it's not going to be... Uh, uh, in other words, Christ has already come. He's coming a second time. When he came the first time, people didn't recognize him. When he comes the second time, they will recognize him, but it'll be too late to do anything about it. It's now, but not yet. One of the problems you have with, well, the basic problem with dominion theology, kingdom now, triumphalism, is they say it's kingdom now, that the church can establish the kingdom before he comes. This was invented largely by Calvinistic Reconstructionists, but it actually goes all the way back to the time of Constantine and Augustine, when they thought that the church was going to Christianize the Roman Empire, except it was no longer really Christianity. Um, it, it is a wrong idea. Uh, I would not go too far in relating what's happening now to the 17th. Uh, of, of, to, to, to Luke chapter 17. Um, the kingdom is already here. Now let's look at another example. I was jaundiced recently in hospital before my surgery. I was turning, my skin was turning yellow. Uh, I was jaundiced, okay? But the gallstones happened before I was jaundiced. The only thing... It was already there. The jaundice was the result of it. Well, the signs are the same. It's already there. It's, it's, the kingdom is already here. It's in us. The jaundice was a symptom proving that the gallstones are already there. Well, when these 
calamities of the last days happen. They will prove the kingdom is already here. That is why Satan knows his time is short. I hope that answer makes sense. Does it? Yeah. We'll go with that, Jacob. Thank you very much. All right. The uh, third question we have is they want to know, Jacob, the, your thoughts, if any, on the He Gets Us commercials that appeared during the Super Bowl. No gospel, no repentance, yeah. definitely not the Jesus of the Bible, right? They were definitely ecumenical, watered down, one size fits all. No. Um, yeah. The, 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 although I don't always agree with them, I certainly don't always agree with them. The Franklin Graham commercials are a bit better, and the Greg Laurie commercials are a bit better doctrinally. That Those things at the Super Bowl were not very good doctrinally. No, anyway. and... I actually wrote an article about that. You can come to my site and I've got, I show who's behind it and uh, some very ecumenical um, type churches. Um, and, you know, they're just trying to get youth to be interested in Jesus. But the problem is they're presenting a different Jesus. They're presenting a Jesus that, you know, he was, uh, he was a immigrant and he, you know, he was a refugee. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. all this kind yeah, of stuff. And, you know, it's, it's a woke Jesus is what it is. Well, I do have to say one good thing about it. It, oh, sure, yeah. it sure made a few radical left people yeah. Um, triggered. Yeah, AOC didn't like it, so it must have Yeah, Whoopi, I think uh, Reed, some of these others, you know, didn't like it. So next question. Next question. Can you explain the seeming uptick in gematria of 666 references in the news events recently, or is gematria itself a waste of time in pursuing? Gematria, known as isopsophy in Greek, gematria is the Hebrew, is not a waste of time. It is used by Matthew right at the beginning of his gospel in the genealogy of Jesus. Um, like David is 14. And it's trying, Matthew's genealogy is trying to show Jesus as the promised son of David. Dalit, Vav, Dalit, David, Daud, but you add it up, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalit is four, right? Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalit, Hey, Vav is six. Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalit is four. David, okay? The, the, it's 14, okay? It's 14. Uh, so Matthew structures the genealogy of Jesus in sets of 14. You know what I mean? It's 14 generations to the captivity, 14 generations. To the... That, that is gematria. It is undeniable that the New Testament uses it. In my book, Shadows of the Beast, how the identity of the Antichrist will be identified to the faithful believers, we deal with, with, with the issue of gematria. Gematria is not a waste of time. Big caveat. Be careful of the rabbinic distortion of gematria used in Kabbalah. Be careful of the Kabbalistic interpretations of gematria. That is a big danger. That is superstition. That is occult, um, or at least borders on the occult. Be careful of the Kabbalistic approaches to gematria. But Gematria itself is absolutely found in the New Testament, and Gematria undoubtedly will feature into the identity of the Antichrist. Another example of Gematria, remember the fish, and they caught, and it gives the number, 153 fish? When you count out in Greek isopsophy, which is the Greek Gematria, you count it out, it's the sons of God. You know, these are the true sons, the fish that were kept. The New Testament authors definitely use gematria, as did other rabbis of, of the day. Unfortunately, the, the, the Kabbalistic rabbis, particularly the Hasids, have corrupted it with Kabbalah. But we're not interested in Kabbalah. We're interested in gematria. Yes, it is scriptural. Thank you, mm. Jacob. All right, final question. Haaretz headline today that Zelensky, like in Russia, to Goliath, saying Ukraine needs David's sling from Israel. What is your thoughts on this? The Israeli um, defense minister met with Zelensky. 
He would not give offensive weapons. And the reason he won't is Israel still needs Russia's cooperation in Syria because of the threat of Iran. Okay? So Netanyahu has brokered certain deals with Putin over Syria. Israel has to put its own security first. Zelensky is a Jew, and Israel doesn't like Putin, but they are forced to do business with him to a degree simply because of the situation in Syria and Iran. Okay? Um, don't forget, Galilee is seriously under threat again because of Hezbollah uh, rocket arsenal that was replenished by Iran via Syria. Um, Israel is in a precarious position strategically. However, its sentiments are plainly with the Ukraine <clears throat> um, for a number of reasons. You have an aged Jewish population in the Ukraine. They're all old. Most of the younger Ukrainians immigrated to Israel or elsewhere long ago. But Zelensky himself is a Jew. Um, now, the fact that he's a Jew, um, it, it, it counters Putin's claim that Nazis control Ukraine. There is a neo-Nazi element in the Western Ukraine for sure, but you can't say it's a neo-Nazi country or they wouldn't have a, a Jewish, <laughs> they wouldn't have <coughs> elected a Jew. Anyway, in the dialogue or in the meeting that the Israeli foreign minister had, he did not give offensive weapons, but he did promise to supply defensive weapons to the Ukraine. So the Israelis are supplying defensive weapons to the Ukraine. But I'll tell you something else, and this is my opinion, but I'm, I'm quite sure it's right. 10 to 1, the Mossad is getting Israeli weapons to the Ukraine via third parties. They are getting offensive weapons to the Ukraine via third parties. They'll remove all the Israeli markings and etchings from it, but it's Israeli manufactured hardware is being is being moved by the Mossad somehow through third parties. I guarantee it. Now I can't prove it, but I I, I know it. I'll put it to you that way. Pretty reasonable. Jacob, we're, they're talking about 500,000 troops from uh, Russia, a two-pronged attack uh, from the south and the east on to Ukraine. Could do you think of and 1,500 new tanks, et cetera, et cetera, you think that uh, the Ukrainians could face such an onslaught? By divine intervention, yes. But we have to remember something. I don't like Putin. He's a bad man. But unlike Western leaders, he stood up about homosexuality and certain other moral issues. Okay? Um, you, you're not talking about a righteous man against a bad man. You're talking about a fight between a lesser of evils. Okay? Zelensky and the Ukrainian government that was in bed with Biden doing these deals is nothing but a lesser of two evils. That's all it is. Okay? Um, Russia is being hurt economically, there's no question. Uh, inflation and so forth. And a lot of people have left Russia because of the draft, because of the forced conscription. That is also true. But day-to-day -day life is still going on normally in most of Russia. They're, they're depleting their reserves, but cash reserves. But it's, it's still going on. People are still living a quasi-normal life in most, most of Russia. That is what Putin needs to continue to continue what he's doing. The cost to the to the Russian army now, they've probably taken 200,000 casualties. Um, it's worse than Afghanistan for them. But day-to-day -day life for most people, like like the, during the Vietnam War, they, was day-to-day -day life, did it affect people? Yeah. Did it affect the day-to-day -day life? No. Well, it's something like that in Russia. Um, the But the Ukraine... It, it, it is not really winning. What what Putin has done is retrench his troops, and he may attack from the north, from Belarus. He's retrenched into defensive positions, which will be difficult for the Ukrainians to extricate unless the West gave them some very powerful weapons, like M1 tanks and, and an abundance and things like that, and German Leopard 2 tanks. It, it, would, it would be very, very difficult 
plus the, the, the missiles. Um, it would be very, very difficult. Um, what he's done is the first thing he's done is that. The second thing he's done is he's attacked the infrastructure and civilian population. He's a ruthless, evil man who will not just target military targets, he'll go after civilian targets. He'll make civilian targets military. Ukraine is paying a high price and this suffering just can't go on. What I say is it is too bad the West does not have an apt leader who could broker a ceasefire and a peace and make some kind of a deal that will be acceptable. But, yep. I, and I know ways that, I know at least proposals that, that might, might even work because Putin is in a jam. There's no question he's in a jam, but desperate people do desperate things. Russia could get an army of 500,000. Now the problem is they have equipment and training. Russian military philosophy, even in the Second World War and in the Cold War, the Warsaw Pact. I know this from Danny. Danny was an intelligence analyst with NSA, but and, and from other people. But Danny really worked in this. Danny spoke Polish, and he was his job was spying on um, communication between the Russian and Polish military. He was a linguist, listen, listening post guy, and he was an all source intelligence analyst. And he told me Russian military philosophy is based on having overwhelming numbers. This they applied in the Middle East when they equipped the Egyptian army with NASA and with the Syrians. They thought that by having overwhelming numbers, they could win, that that quantity would trump quality. Well, they, when they fought the Israelis, that didn't happen. Despite the fact that the Yom Kippur War was a near disaster, it still didn't happen. The Israelis beat them. Their quantity did not trump quality. Um, but that is the same philosophy Putin is following, that quantity trumps quality. Um, that That is the real issue in the strategic thinking of Putin. Will quantity trump quality? Well, unless the Ukrainians were trained to use Leopard tanks and M1 tanks, and they had more Heimers, the, the, uh, plus the, the aerial stuff, um, they, they wouldn't be able to withstand the quantity. If they had the quality, they could. But the West has not given them the best, most of the best weapons yet. Right. May take too long. They're saying maybe yeah. by the 24th uh, yeah. the anniversary, you may bring it. Yeah, your... and an M1 tank is so heavy, like 72 tons or something. It is basically a huge gun on a vehicle with a rocket engine, with a jet engine, rather. The cost of maintaining it and and transporting it on on you know on in, in a combat city, just getting it where it goes on its own treads it, it, it's not a weapon it's a weapon system it needs high maintenance and it needs its own transport system and it needs people who are trained to use it my son was in tanks in the Israeli army in Merkava he knows about the American M1. He, he, it, it, it's not an ordinary tank. Among ordinary tanks, the Makava is a good tank, the British Challenger 2 is a good tank, and the Israeli Makava, which is a combination of an armored personnel carrier and a tank, they're all good tanks. But the M1 is so big, and, and that engine, that, that, that jet engine, it's, it's, it's not a tank in the normal sense people think of tanks. It takes months and months and months to train a tank crew, where are they going to do it? Yep. Do they have the time? So that's it for questions. Are we ready to go to backstage? We are ready to go back to backstage. So I will. Uh, is there a the lag screen? between? Is there a lag between going there and and uh, starting up the back page? Yeah, give us about about fifteen to twenty seconds. So. Oh, okay. For those of you on YouTube, thank you for joining us. We'll be going to backstage now. Uh, see you there. Hey, you all know me. It's uh, Jay from Moriel. Usually behind the scenes, as you know, we have been shadow banned on YouTube. If you have a friend, if you have a family member, if you have another person that you know is a brother or sister in Jesus Christ, we ask you to reach out to them. Ask them to subscribe. Send a link. Press like. Leave a comment. All of these things help in a major way help the ministry and help the channel grow. Thank you for your time and thank you for watching Moriel TV.